Welcome back. Last video we were talking about detectors. And I didn't mention this, but of course we have evolved remarkable ways to detect and sense the world around us, especially from a chemical sense. I think the nose is actually our best chemical detector. Let me explain. So think about all the different kinds of molecules that you could have out there. These molecules would of course enter your nose and your brain is designed to, to sense the difference between them. So there's olfactory receptors up there uh, and different molecules will trigger different types of reactions. Our noses are actually designed to be able to detect and distinguish something like a trillion different smells, which is extremely remarkable. That's a big number. So what we're talking about here is really the term selectivity, which means being able to sense one different kind of molecule from another. And that's not the same as being able to detect things at lower levels. Of course, we know that dogs have a keener sense of smell than us. They're also able to sense different kinds of molecules. They actually have in their, in their noses 300 times more sensors, different kinds of receptors that are able to distinguish the molecules. Now, you think that's good. Uh, this is not the king of the animal kingdom, but a black bear actually has an even keener sense of smell. It has like over 2,000 times the, the number of receptors in their nose compared to what we have. I guess this begs the question now, which animal has the keenest sense of smell? Uh, Maybe uh, it could be a shark. Uh, we know that a, sar a shark can sense uh, blood in the water around them at really, really low concentrations, at one part per billion. And it's just doing that by sensing the chemicals, sensing very, very low levels. That's a really remarkable level. But in fact, that is nowhere near the, the, the limit of sensitivity in the animal kingdom. The winner goes to this creature right over here. Um, yeah, isn't he lovely? A moth, actually, it's, it's the antenna that you're looking at here. The moth can sense molecules as they bind to those antennae at a concentration, well, better to say, at a level of one single molecule. So nothing can come close to that. These are all down to its ability to sense pheromones in the air and find a mate. So in this video, we're going to be talking specifically about something called a detection limit. That's one of those terms it's a definition, but it's a quantitative definition that refers to how good uh, an instrument or an assay is at sensing different compounds. So to describe the limited detection, I'm going to give you a specific example. So this is a flame, and it's actually attached to this instrument right here. This is something that we have in our lab, fortunately something that you wouldn't be using this year. We would have been using it, uh, but let me show you right now, and, and you'll know exactly how it works. So we have a flame right here. It's a, it's a propane type flame that's burning compounds. And you can see the bright orange color. And if you're thinking back, then it's like, what's that orange coming from? It's from sodium. Where did the sodium come from? How did it get in? Well, it's actually up from a little straw over here. So a solution of, of water with sodium in it is being drawn up into the flame. And as soon as it does that, it burns. I know it's water, but the, the water is sort of nebulized little tiny droplets and they evaporate, they release the sodium, and there's kind of a little bit of a, of a reaction going on within there, but that's what releases the light. Now, the job of the rest of the instrument is actually to be able to capture and quantify how much that light is. So you'll see on, on this side, there's a mirror and it's just there to deflect the light and lens it down onto this apparatus right here. This is a detector, which is kind of the same thing like your smartphone that can see light. And on the front of it, we have what you call a monochrometer. It's just something that can dial in the wavelength, the light, the, the specific color that you want to see. So the detector can quantify how much light that is. And your eye can do the same. So if we're just looking at this flame and it's just sort of burning, doing nothing in there, as soon as we start adding a bit of distilled water to it, the color changes, but hopefully distilled water doesn't actually have any dissolved sodium in it. If we were to put just a small amount of sodium, this is tap water, so not salt water, just the trace amount of sodium that's present in tap water, you see the dramatic shift in color. You can actually use this to build up basically a calibration curve. So the readings that we get, these digital numbers that come out, quantify the intensity of that color. And as you work your way up to higher levels of sodium, higher colors of that light, 
eventually it reaches a point where it's off scale. We've talked about how this thing would be drawn. It calibrates and doesn't necessarily go linear over the whole range. All right, so here's the, the little experiment that we did. What we're gonna do here is just take some readings as we pass water through it. Of course, the water will have different levels of sodium. Here's our distilled water. Let's just call that the blank, the background, the base level. You can see it's pretty much hovering around zero. It's not exactly zero, it's flickering because the light is flickering as well. Now we put some water in. So this is just cold tap water straight out of the tap and we're putting it through and quite obviously that color changes to a very bright intense yellow and you see the numbers go up from there. Now we're going to try something else. Believe it or not, we're just going to use tap water once again, but we're going to take it from the hot water uh, out of the sink. And you'll see, maybe, I don't know, you'll see a color change. So this is just hot water, tap water still. Of course, it's still giving us that sodium reading and the numbers are coming out. They're not exactly constant, but the question comes down, is it the same? Are these two numbers the same between cold water and tap water? Well, let's take a look at the data. So I don't have all the, the numbers plotted from what we just saw, but you can kind of see these readings come out from there. Between these numbers, we might as well do something like calculate an average, calculate a standard deviation. In fact, we know how many points we've done. You could do this type of analysis. We talked about that in a pre previous video, being able to compare whether these two numbers are the same or not. That's something called a t-test. So you'll find a video on that. Now, just for fun here, what if we were to cycle back and forth between cold water, hot water, cold water, hot water, back and forth again? You'll see that the numbers are moving up and down, and it's kind of pretty obvious just visually to see every single time you're inserting hot water, it looks definitely at a higher level than the cold water was before. You notice the signals that we had before. We were around the 110 mark, working our way 113, 114. Now, let's just change the numbers. So we're going to get rid of those signal numbers, and I'm just going to call this number zero. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm just going to say this is the baseline. It really doesn't matter what that number is. It's just a number. This is now our new baseline. And the question is, is this higher than that? Well, I haven't really changed anything. You still look at it and say, yeah, that's higher than that. But how do we quantify it? How do we know exactly when you can tell that there is a difference? So that's what limit of detection is really all about. I'll put some numbers on there just so we have them. But when it comes down to it, what we're comparing is the scatter in the data compared to how high the signal is. So we don't just have signal height, we have noise as well. And the two of these are connected together. You can't get more signal without getting more noise. What you're about to see is highly classified. At 0 hundred hours, Planet X-3 was attacked by a mysterious death sphere. Magnify that death sphere. Why is it still blurry? That's all the resolution we have. Making it bigger doesn't make it clearer. It does on CSI Miami. Ugh. So here's our question. You're looking at that data and I'm asking you, do you see a signal? Are you sure? Well, yeah, I mean, it's right there. It's pretty obvious, it's a peak, it looks good. But what if we start dropping that down? At what point do you decide that there's a signal? Now, is that a signal? Do you need a little bit more? How about now? At what level is this truly above the baseline? Knowing that the baseline is not perfect, it can kind of move up and down. So we don't necessarily know that we have that signal. We have to compare the signal intensity to the noise, and that's what limited detection is about. So what I'm drawing here is our baseline and the signal above it. The noise is reflected in the standard deviation, so we can calculate standard deviations from multiple numbers of points. So that is our noise. The signal, of course, goes from the baseline up to where we have the, the average of that. The definition of limit of detection actually can be different, but most people accept three times the, the noise value. So you have our little distance here representing the noise, multiply that by three, and this is the critical point that says as long as our signal is above that line, we're gonna call it a real signal. So right now the answer is yes, this is a real signal. If the signal were to drop, so right at that point where it's dropped below the line, this is the picture that we're saying is no longer a real detectable signal. Another way to say this is that the noise could randomly just sort of bounce up and down like that. You wouldn't be sure 
that you've detected a signal at this point. Likewise, if the noise were to increase, well then you need to bring that arrow up three times, so you need to have a higher signal to go proportional to that. So it's all down to signal to noise. The signal to, to, to noise ratio is reflected in the difference between the response value and the baseline. The baseline could be zero, but it doesn't matter. So you're looking at this difference over the standard deviation of our blank. So the blank, the background can really reflect the same thing. So that's what this equation relates to. Now, that's actually just one way of computing a limit of detection. You can also calculate a limit of detection from a calibration curve. So what we're looking at here actually relates to the regression component of this class. So we have a calibration curve. And in our calibration curve, we've determined the trend line. And the trend line is fit, but not perfectly. You see that there's some error. There's some scatter in that. What you can do is extrapolate how low we can work our way down before we no longer have a reliable signal. So just to remind you of these terms here, when we're talking about sensitivity, we're simply referring to the slope of the calibration curve. So you can imagine we have a line that's going straight up and a linear equation that defines that line. The slope is the sensitivity. Sensitivity and detection limit are not the same thing. When we say sensitivity to an analytical chemist, we mean the slope of the line. If the slope goes up, the sensitivity has gone up, not necessarily the limit of detection. They are different definitions. So how do we calculate a limit of detection from a calibration curve? Well, to do this properly, you're going to have to go into a program like Excel and do a complete regression analysis. So we're not just looking at determining the slope of the line, uh, the trend line. We're looking at the statistics on it as well. So we're looking to pull out these numbers here. Now, if you're not sure how to do that, there are videos already on this site. So I'll direct you to Dr. Wenzel's video here. And by the way, there's the time span around the 40 minute mark in that video. I know it's long, but he wanted to put a lot of information there. So if you just wanna see how to get at this regression output in Excel, he'll show you how to do that just fine. So from our data output, this is actually what you're looking for. You simply need the slope, which I guess you could get immediately just by doing a simple regression. But you also need what we refer to as the standard error. It has the symbol S sub Y. So this is the error associated with that regression. So once you've obtained those numbers from your regression analysis, the limit of detection is defined as three times the standard error divided by the sensitivity or the slope. So you do your calculation from there, you get a number 2.5. whoop de doo what does it all mean, Basil? Okay, that's, that's a good question. I mean, it's, it's just a number, but like, where is it going? So let's just kind of look at units for a second. If we look at the standard deviation of our response, or S sub Y versus the slope, we're looking at a response divided by a change in response over a change in concentration. So the way our units would work out is that we could basically cancel the response. And in the end, since we have one over, one over concentration, this value is going to report to us a concentration. In other words, the value from the x-axis. So the number that we're computing here is going to refer to the concentration at which the signal is no longer high enough that we can reliably see it. Actually, it's the point where we can just see it. So we're going to be reporting from this equation what the minimum concentration is to reflect uh, a signal that's big enough to be able to measure it. So just a quick summary, the limit of detection is an important term in analytical chemistry, both from the definition standpoint, what it means, as well as how you do the calculations with it. So make sure you're familiar with both and uh, practice your problems. And we'll see you in the next video.